Um, uh, I'm uh, Felicity Scott, been a, um, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here to the fourth Detlef Mertens Lecture uh, on the Histories of Modernity, an annual event hosted in memory of Detlef's life and his scholarly work, and which celebrates his avowed commitment uh, to coupling academic rigor with an ethics of innovation um, or transformation, so with the belief that, that architectural history uh, is something um, that can change. So while evident throughout the longer trajectory of his work, Detlef's historical project of seeking a type of open-endedness or an openness to the future, as distinct from something like codifying cultural codes or norms, and the sense of urgency uh, which attended much of his research was very clearly articulated in the introduction to his 2011 collection of essays, Modernity Unbound. Situating um, his writings uh, in the context of his introduction, within the ever unfolding context of modernity, he recalled, and, and I'm quoting him, I came to focus on things that had been misunderstood or overlooked in the historical record and could therefore serve as mediators for new thought and design. The writing of architectural history can close down the past or open it up anew. It can bind historical experience into yet another ism or it can unlock the life of modernity that resides even in the modernisms we already have. So Detlef's major uh, monograph on Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, uh, simply titled Mies, appeared posthumously in 2013, and it stands as a remarkable uh, testament to how architectural historians might critically revisit the discipline's relation to modernity, even sometimes taking uh, a canonical figure like Mies as an entry point. And it was on the occasion uh, of the Mies book uh, that we launched this series, seeking to identify younger scholars whose research similarly seeks such critical openings, such enlivenings, and such a productive unsettling uh, of the project of writing art, uh, architectural history. So tonight, very delighted to be able to welcome uh, and to introduce Ayala Levine uh, to present the first, fourth lecture uh, in this series. Ayala is currently an assistant professor of architectural history within the art history department at Northwestern uh, University, where her teaching and research focus on the history of architecture and urbanism in post-colonial, early post-independence, uh, sub-Saharan African states. Uh, and it's work that complicates in important and rigorous ways the field's extant narratives of modernity uh, and of modernization, uh, a point to which I'll, I'll come back when I finish. So prior to arriving at Northwestern, uh, she was a fellow at the Princeton Mellon Initiative in Architecture and Urbanism and the Humanities, uh, an opportunity that she used uh, to turn her already remarkable dissertation uh, written here at Columbia into a book manuscript and the working title, I hope I have this right, Ayala, uh, is Exporting Zionism, question mark, Israeli Architectural Development Aid in Postcolonial Africa, 1958 to 1973. And in the intervening years between um, being here at Columbia and Princeton, she was part of a European Research Council um, project entitled Apartheid, the Global Itinerary at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, uh, for which, uh, among other things, she developed some really groundbreaking work on Julian Beinart, uh, which was published in Architecture Beyond Europe under the title, and I quote here, Basic Design and the Semiotics of Citizenship, Julian Beinart's Educational Experiments and Research on Wall Decoration in Early 1960s Nigeria and South Africa. I cite this one because I've quoted it recently in my own work. It's a fantastic uh, piece of research. Uh, also appearing in that same journal uh, is a punctual and I think quite seminal reflection on complicating global histories titled Beyond Global Versus Local, Tipping the Scales of Architectural Historiography. Uh, it's a text also that I've assigned uh, in a series of classes and I think is really exemplary of Ayala's talent in drawing out complex issues with a type of economy and clarity that is rare and extremely productive and, and very welcome. She has a series of other publications to her credit, which I won't go through, but these are ones I wanted to um, flag in this context. So Ayala has been invited to give this year's Mountains Lecture, not only in, on account of her outstanding and original scholarly research, but for the critical methodological approach that she brings to bear on writing histories of architecture and urbanism. Uh, as we shall see tonight, I imagine. Ayala's research remains in a strong and knowing dialogue with extant histories of architecture's role in the violence of the European colonial enterprise and its aftermath in conferring modern identities to new nation states. 
but both in her reading of African-Israeli technical cooperation in sub-Saharan Africa, and in a new project focused on North American claims to global expertise, again, in the context largely of Africa, she articulates complex, nuanced, and multifaceted accounts of transnational exchange and, and of development that expand beyond east-west and north-south axes, opening up a variegated field of objects, of actors, of sites, of institutions, and forms of knowledge that have informed uh, and which continue to inform processes of modernization in the so-called global south. So it's an account then of her rigorous scholarship and her fine-grained research, but also, as I mentioned, her commitment uh, to forging new and more inclusive frameworks for thinking about architecture and modernity, those in which other voices and other knowledges come to visibility, that we've invited her uh, to be this year's Mountains Lecturer. So finally, I want to thank uh, my fellow committee members, Keller Easterling, Barry Bergdahl, Edward Dimmenberg, uh, and especially our sponsors, uh, the Mertens family, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, who are here in the audience, and Keller, and of course, Dean Andreas and the events team here uh, at GSEP for continuing to ensure that this series remains an important event uh, in the GSEP calendar, uh, and more generally, I think, uh, as an annual lecture that celebrates innovative, innovative scholarship uh, in architectural history. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Ayala to the podium. Uh, Hi, uh, thank you. I would like to start off by saying how, um, thank you Felicity for this generous introduction and how pleased and honored I am to come back here to GSAP where uh, most of my scholarship that I owe so much uh, to uh, and uh, has been foundational for my uh, intellectual formation. And I'm also very honored to uh, give this talk as part of the Detlef Martins lecture. Um, in a way, I'm referring back to Lucia's, uh, Lucia Le's first inaugural uh, lecture here four years ago, where she discussed, her, um, discussed and analyzed the UNESCO building facade as a device of global governance. So um, I continue this. Uh, uh, project, uh, in a sense, uh, of uh, discussing the post-war global globality of the corporate facade, uh, with this, uh, with by introducing uh, actors uh, that are uh, peripheral to the hegemonic center, peripheral to the discourse, people who have not produced theory uh, and whose archives are really hard to excavate, um, and. Um, with a specific interest in climate and ornament, the relationship between the two. So I'll begin now. Um, in the double spread of the opening pages of US-based Hungarian emigre brothers, Victor and Alidar Olgay, 1957 solo control and shading devices, we find the juxtaposition of two facades, both situated in Rio, on the left, a mid-century modernist curtain wall, punctuated with vertical fins, and on the right, a Baroque building. Next to the images, an, epi an epigraph by Marcel Brauer reads, the sound control device has to be on the outside of the building, an element of the facade, an element of architecture, and because this device is so important a part of our open architecture, it may develop into a charistica form as the Doric column. In this brief statement, Breuer displays the sun shading device from the techno-scientific environmental discourse to recast it anew, anew as a cultural achievement, compared no less to the epitome of classical architecture, the Doric column. Was Breuer, Breuer and the Olgays after him constituting the sun shading device as a new order, a sort of post-war reprise similar to Le Corbusier's return to order in the wake of World War I? The Olga superimposition of Blondel's human profile on the facade of the Ministry of Health and Education in Rio, famous for its brisole, further confirms this assertion. Through this recasting, the sand shady device was now an architectural element equivalent to the classical order and its cultural significance far exceeding its technical application. At stake in this new order was a universalism based on geographical specificity. For Breuer, this was not only the concern of southern countries with hot climate, where the sunshade in device had originally developed, 
as is evident by his own application of sun shading devices in his campus architecture in Minnesota, St. John's University, and here in New York campus, in the NYU campus in the Bronx. Rather, it was a reaffirmation of the internationalism of modern architecture at a time when it was challenged, contested by the geopolitical reorganization of a new world order, following the demise of the French and British colonial powers and the rise of new independent nations in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. As Blondel's profile suggests, the question of the sun shading device is intimately linked to the concepts of the human, or man's relationship with the environment, and the forms of post-war or post-colonial subjectivity it entailed. Taking my cue from Breuer and the Olgays, but not submitting to their vision of classical humanism, I would like to broaden the discussion to other forms of subjectivity, the post-war discourse on architecture and its role in post-colonial social and economic development has instigated. By focusing on the building scheme as a site where these relations were negotiated, this analysis bridges two seemingly disparate concerns in the history of modern architecture climate and ornament, or biopolitics and aesthetic representation. In my talk today, I would like to address these issues by examining a project for a regional university in Nigeria, carried out by a team of Israeli architects starting in the early 60s with consultation of landscape architects of the University of Wisconsin. In this story, the Israeli and American teams represent two distinct, although for the most part complementary, cultures of expertise. I examine how these cultures of expertise were brought to bear on the recent legacy of colonial rule, specifically its construct of tropicality and the troubled relationship between men and environment it was predicated upon. So here I'm referring to tropicality as in tropical architecture in British colonial discourse, rather than tropicality in Latin America, which was a self-affirmative uh, um, rejection of uh, or contestation of uh, modern architecture um, coming from the South. Conceived in 1960 in anticipation of Nigeria's independence, uh, Nigeria became independent in October 60, and as part of original competition over the allocation of higher education in the country, IFE University was the Western Nigerians government crown piece of independence. So this was the situation in federal Nigeria in 1960s, was comprised of three regions, each with an independent, um, uh, with an autonomous government. Um, and Ife is located um, over here, close to Ibadan. So a federal committee, British-led federal committee, um, decided to uh, establish two regional universities, one in North Nigeria, one in East Nigeria, and, but not in the West, uh, saying that because uh, there is a, a federal university in Ibadan and a new one is going to be established in Lagos, the Western Nigeria government does not need to establish a new regional university, but uh, the Western government um, decided to move on their own and publish a white paper that refuted uh, this commission's um, advice. So it, initiated, it was initiated against the recommendation of a British-led committee. It was to present a post-colonial alternative to the neighboring University College Ibadan. So at the time, the University College Ibadan was um, the crown piece, the epitome of modernity in uh, Nigeria. It was celebrated as the most modernist um, campus uh, co building complex uh, in West Africa, perhaps, even. The problem that the university administration presented to the Israeli team, headed by Baos graduate Ari Sharon, was how to design a university. Sorry. I will come back to this. How to design a university that would be both modern and decisively post-colonial. So University College Ibadan, if that was the image of modernity, how to be modern but not look like that? What would be that image of modernity that would be post-colonial? This problem was articulated specifically in relation to climate and university curriculum reform, following the American land-grant university model. 
Unlike University College Ibadan, which was established in 48 by British colonial administration, following the Oxbridge model at the outskirts of a great metropolitan area, I remind you that Ibadan was bigger, larger than Lagos at the time, the University of Ife, much like the other two regional universities uh, that were established immediately with independence, saw in the democratic and rural settings of the American Land Grant University with its emphasis on applied research in agriculture and technical fields, a better fitting model to cater for the immediate development needs of the region. The site chosen for the campus location next to the town of Ife was deemed appropriate, and this is the town of Ife, and it grew as a traditional town uh, from the palace at the center, radiantly, eccentrically, uh, this is the university campus, and here are the vast uh, farmland that was uh, um, given by the local chief. The site chosen for the campus location was deemed appropriate to fulfill this goal precisely for its semi-rural character and the vast agricultural land, uh, the Ife of Uni, Uni sorry, Ife's Uni, the local Yoruba king, made available for this purpose. So the land allocated here was 3,000 acres compared to the 500 acres in Ibadan. British colonial architects Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, who were responsible for the design of the University of Ibadan, envisioned the university as the epitome of their tropical architecture approach, which they had developed during their tenure as colonial officers in West Africa in the 40s and 50s. This body of knowledge derived from the colonial medical discourse on tropical disease and hygiene, as it pertained primarily to help colonial administration and soldiers to survive in what they perceived as hostile environments. Hence, uh, the wall becomes a filtering device compared to the ventilation helmet on the right. By the time Sharona arrived to Nigeria in 1960, the discourse on tropical architecture was so prevalent that even the, the, the vice chancellor of the future university expected him to address it as a problem. So here on the right, we see vice, vice chancellor Ajose, who has been, had been the first African professor at University College Ibadan before becoming uh, the VC for IFE. And he also acted uh, in Ibadan as the head of its department of preventive and social medicine. So in a sense, he was educated in Glasgow, in a sense, he uh, carries on the British um, um, perception of the environment, but at the same time he wishes to revise it, to adapt it to the conditions of independent Nigeria. The challenge the VC presented to Sharon was double. How to be modern and respond to the climate, but in a completely new form that would rival the architectural image of the University College of Ibadan. So the stakes were not formal alone. The challenge was how to render man-environment relationship in the tropical climate as productive, that is, conductive to agricultural production. In other words, the conception of the environment not as something that man needs protecting from, but can be beneficial for his existence. Given his experience working under architect Hannes Meyer, who was famous for including climatic conditions in his multiple calculations, as well as adapting modern architecture to conditions in Israel, Sharon was no stranger to climatic considerations. However, in Israel, these concerns were not consolidated discursively into a body of knowledge comparable to the British tropical architecture approach. Nonetheless, Sharon was quick to adapt to this discourse as you can see from his posture. Climate, not a problem. <laughs> in part in Israel, a privileged position as a microclimatic pilot country where experimentation had already been taking place for some decades. Unlike British colonial expertise, it was implied that Jewish settlers had first-hand experience with climate and did not assume a temporal geographic distance as in the colonial metropole and its African and Asian laboratories, quote unquote, and the knowledge power axis it entailed. So um, I would like to just briefly uh, look at this gesture. Uh, what we have here is a performance, first of all, of the informality of the Israeli architects compared to the uh, more um, um, composed uh, Nigerian um, um, elite 
at least Nigerian professor who was educated under British um, rule. Um, so the Israeli performs his own um, uh, informality as an architect and also his approach to the climate. He exposes himself to the elements. He is almost reckless in it. And um, for example, malaria was not an issue for him at all when he talked to the professors in uh, IFE because um, in Israel he was taking the role of a pioneer um, in establishing a kibbutz and exposure to malaria was kind of an initiation process into becoming a, a good Zionist. Um, between 1961 and 1962, Sharon arrived at the solution of the inverted pyramid, whose climatic benefits he explained in a series of sketches. These sketches contrasted between a self-protecting building and applied solar shade devices. In this second statement, I argue, Sharon presented a damning critique of the tropical architecture approach, using modernist architectural logic to reject the application of external devices to the building surface. In other words, he rendered the shading devices additive as ornaments, since they were not integral to the building structure or contributed to its spatial flexibility. This devout adherence to modernist principles can be traced to Sharon's studies at the Bauhaus, of course. However, as the title of Sharon's monograph, Kibbutz plus Bauhaus, suggests, Sharon attributed his experience at the Kibbutz, a Zionist collective agricultural settlement which he had helped found prior to his studies at the Bauhaus, uh, actually the Kibbutz paid for his studies at the Bauhaus, a comparable formative experience. For this reason, rather than looking at his professional decisions in abstract or technical terms, or just as part of general international trends, I propose to read them as symptoms of Sharon's embodied cosmopolitanism, a term I borrow from Bruce Robbins, who's faculty here at Columbia, to emphasize that Sharon's cosmopolitan position as a foreign architect in Nigeria is very much embedded in his experience in settler colonialism and nation building in Palestine, where the relationship between the new Jew, the Zionist take on the European Union, and the national territory were highly politicized. Sharon's contestation of the exclusivity of Fry and Drew's climate control architectural solution demonstrates how the techno-scientific notion of climate was intricately linked to issues of race, eugenics, nationality, and sovereignty. The arrival of different architectural solutions to the same empirical parameters discloses how the trans translation of studies of climate into architectural form is ideologically charged specifically regarding the desired relationship between men and environment, and in this case, the Nigerian students and their campus. If architecture was the solution to the problem of climate, what needs to be interrogated in this analysis is how, in each of the solutions given to it, climate was constructed as a problem in the first place. In order to fully understand the implications of Sharon's critique, we need to confront two colonial structures of thought the British imperial one, and the Zionist settler colonial one. For Fry and Drew, the tropics presented a violent attack on the census, on the census with which they explained colonial subjects' lethargy and backwardness. Their architecture, even when applied to the colonizing subjects, emphasized physical and psychological separation from the tropical environment. Lying at the heart of this separation was the deep-seated fear of racial degeneration of the colonizer acclimatizing too well, becoming native, quote unquote, would not only lead to moral and physical degeneration, but would also defeat the very idea of racial superiority that justified colonization in the first place. So what we have here are images from, the, from Fry and Drew's 1956 book. So that's, this was the height of decolonization in uh, West Africa, in British West Africa. And what is um, interesting is that while they're referring to the post-colonial Nigerian subject, they have an issue, the, the issue of acclimatization remains as a problem. But the Nigerian subject that not, does not need to acclimatize. So this is an inherently colonial problem, the problem of the colonizer rather than of the colonized or the decolonizing subject. And it is not by chance, I think, that these two images that are very problematic in this sense um, were removed 
from their uh, subsequent publications following the independence of uh, those countries. So they had a problem applying or translating their studies, their methodologies into the post-colonial situation. The fear of racial degeneration also haunted Zionism. Albeit with the influence of the German Volkish movement, it took on a specific nationalist territorial dimension. The Zionist discourse was affected by race science discourse and accepted its proposition that the Jews are a degenerating race. However, Zionist thinkers shifted the emphasis from biological essentialism, the idea that the Jews were inherently degenerate, to environmental causes such as the living conditions in the Eastern European shtetl, the Jewish town, or the modern alienating city in which most Western Euro European Jews lived. Influenced by the popular movements of Lebensreform, life reform, and corporal culture, body culture, as well as social Darwinism and neo lamarckism Zionist thinkers sought to reverse the effects of degeneration by national regeneration in the homeland, Zion. The healing of the Jewish body could only occur through its relocation to the native land, and a transformation through the working of this land into a productive nation. The same logic was extended metaphorically to the land of Palestine, which in a typical Orientalist view was perceived as dead land, infertile and unproductive. Thus, this discourse displaced the Jews' de de degeneration and projected it onto the Arab inhabitants of the land and their supposedly degenerate agriculture. In this formulation, only by reconnecting the Jews, the Jewish people to their land, will the two be regenerated and cured. So it is not by chance, I argue, that the same architects and the same vision of uh, um, a natural abundance, the land of milk and honey, uh, was uh, engineered in uh, scientific institutions, campuses, uh, national parks, and kibbutzim. And these architects, Yalom Lipa and Dantzur, were uh, actually invited. Uh, Yalom Lipa was invited by Sharon to uh, consult on the landscaping of the Ife University campus. Lipa visited the site, but uh, didn't end up working on the project. Central to this bodily turn in modern Jewish history is Max Nordau, a Zionist physician and a journalist who coined the term muscular Judaism to denote the rebirth of the new Jew in his native land. In architectural history, however, Nord Nordo is known for his monumental work, Degeneration, a critique of fantasiac culture. Like Nordo, who extended this discourse to material culture, Adolf Loss applied this discourse, the discourse of degeneration to architecture, as is well known. In his famous essay, Ornament and Crime, he argued that ornamentation, like the tattoos of criminals and primitives, is a symptom of unproductive societies. While Loss's decentralized and dematerialized plain white wall was especially appealing to Viennese Jews, who were among his favorite clients, in Palestine, the plain white wall served to reimagine the Jew as a new viral body that no longer needed to hide or camouflage itself. In this Zionist narrative of men environment mutual rejuvenation, architecture served as a mediator for the sensual connectivity with the territory rather than as a protective shelter in its traditional sense, extending the sensory organs and limbs of the new muscular Jew. So the idea was that in, uh, in Europe, the Jew cannot expose himself in his Jewishness. And this exposure was uh, not only mental, but was physical at, uh, as well. Express the expression of his Jewishness was something that uh, was disclosed uh, via bodily performance, degeneration. Um, in, in Palestine, the Jew can uh, rejuvenate his body, and architecture played a mediating role in that, not by sheltering, protecting from their environment, but mediating this connectivity. Embodying the fantasy of national physical rejuvenation, the white wall was the matter through which Zionism could constitute itself in the flesh. Productivity was also a primary concern for the University of Wisconsin team of landscape architects, who divorced it completely from the haunting threat of the generation. The team arrived in Nigeria in 1966 to consult on the design of the University of Ife campus as part of a university building assistant program the US Agency for International Development launched five years earlier. Following the establishment of agriculture universities in India, in 1951, 
This was the largest American assistance program in Africa to date. This assistance involved pairing a major American land-grant university with Nigeria's newfound regional universities. Kansas State University partnered with Ahmadou Bello University in the north, Michigan State University with the University of Nigeria at Nasuka in the east, and the University of Wisconsin with the University of Ife in the west. Through this access to large tracts of land, otherwise locked in traditional land tenure, American experts could introduce an experiment with the modernization of agriculture in the region, in parallel with what came to be known as the Green Revolution concurrently waged in Asia. In contrast to the tropical architecture approach that sought to neutralize or to filter the effects of climate, the Wisconsin team sought to incorporate the tropical climate into their design calculations. While the team used Fry and Drew's seminal books on tropical architecture, the studies of Victor and Aladar Ogye, who address energy resources as a global rather than a colonial concern, helped them to shift the discourse away from viewing the tropics as a hazard that needs protecting from. So as you can see here, um, the arrows in Fry and Drew are unidirectional, while in uh, the algae, algae they are um, they're pointing to two directions and they're um, much more dynamic in the sense. Uh, the the Olgiais articulated climate, the Olgiais and the Wisconsin team after, that are, after them articulated climate into an array of resources, such as sun radiation and soil, including the bodies of the students themselves who took part in the cycle of energy production and loss. And here we have the abstraction of the universal, quote unquote, universal uh, corporate men in uh, the Olgiers into a more abstract uh, figure that could include the African body uh, in the Wisconsin team's report. The Wisconsin team rationalized climate to make it calculable and manageable so that production can be maximized through what they perceived as the proper integration of, I quote, human needs and resource goals. This shift corresponded with a more general tendency in the post-war era to supplant racial or climatic determinism with theories such as human capital, which postulated that human resources, once invested to become human capital, determined development more than natural resources. This theory assumed that, while natural resources are limited, there is no limit to economic growth via skill acquisition and university education. In the third world, as the Chicago School economist Theodore Schultz explained, founding universities and setting up programs for knowledge transfer required healthy surroundings to succeed. So it's not enough to have education. In those places, you need to have a, an environment that would be conductive to that education. In addition to creating a healthy environment, a more pressing concern was the rebranding of the countryside. Since under colonial rule, education, upward mobility, and access to the rewards of modernity were associated strictly with the city, the Israeli and American teams faced the double challenge of attracting faculty from the nearby urban centers of Lagos and Ibadan to the semi-rural siting of the campus, and to compel students to return to their family farms following graduation. At stake was the creation of alternative imaginaries of the countryside, so that the status of the farmer and rural living conditions would be elevated to present a desirable alternative to the city. As Sherwood Berg, the American agricultural economist and educator explained, who also worked in Asia as advisor, we modify the technology to fit the prevailing attitudes. We modify the local socioeconomic setting to make room for the technology. In other words, in order to introduce American farming technologies, there were at least two fundamental issues that needed to be addressed. First, land tenure reform, to which the university ground served as a demonstration field. And second, the recreation of the countryside anew, so it could offer an attractive alternative to the city. So in a sense, if the city was the measure of modernity, the countryside had to be more modern than modern, more modern than the city. The regional university campus served as the ideal setting for this education of desire by demonstrating modern rural living. Just as the university farm served for demonstration for nearby farmers, so did the residential quarters of the university faculty and staff 
scattered in the lush vegetation between the agriculture faculty and the university farm, demonstrated high quality living standards in the rural area. The problem of image the University of Ife was facing did not, did not only regard the status of farming as a profession and the betterment of living standards in the rural environment, but also the association of social mobility, cultural capital, and urbanity strictly with the city. Alongside the high standard of living, the Israeli planners envisioned the university as a cultural center that would boost Ife's importance as the cradle of Yoruba culture. Yoruba is the major ethnic uh, group in this area. So, the Israelis uh, uh, imbibed uh, the abstract human capital with um, um, national purposefulness, cultural um, and racial pride. The importance given to culture and agriculture as two equal components in the production of national subjects is reflected in the early plans for the campus, which are based on a divide between the academic core and the faculty of agriculture. So uh, this is the academic core that you saw in the, one of the first images, and this is the faculty of agriculture. And over here are the farms, and the um, scattered around here are the faculty housing. Since the American Land Grant University offered no rational plans for the marriage of culture and education with agriculture, they, were, they grew organically, uh, they grew historically rather than planned this way, Sharon resorted to kibbutz planning, which he was well familiar with as a planner of the kibbutz LT movement. The two separate but complementing entities, the academic core and the faculty of agriculture, constituted the nuclear of the campus from its early inception. So before there was a plan, there were two cores, the cultural administrative core and the agriculture uh, faculty. And, um, and their composition became the plan's organizing principle. The kibbutz offered a particularly fitting modern model for this coupling, as its social core is often comprised of public buildings, such as libraries, museums, or auditoria, and as such presented a unique example of bringing the cult cultural institutions of the city to their rural environment. In an essay Sharon published in 1940 on public buildings, he expressed his misgivings that architecture in Palestine is still too European and that public buildings in the rural settlements were still too urban. I am certain, he concluded, that when our roots will deepen in the country, the climate will be a determinant factor in the building's planning and would determine its Israeli unique character. For Sharon, therefore, climate was the conduit through which modern architecture can be made formally and materially at home. The most important site of this acclimatization was the building's skin. In Nigeria, Sharon emphasized the volume of the building's envelope as the site where locality can be embodied without dressing for the weather, a term colonial British architect Edward Lotchens used to describe his architectural approach for New Delhi. With his inverted pyramid, um, these, are, sorry, these are the humanities. So this, this is the first uh, faculty ensemble that was built and determined the entire uh, character of this core. With this inverted pyramid, Sharon challenged the necessity of various sun shading devices that Fire and Drew used, and that became, under the guise of climate control, their prominent decorative feature. The ambiguity of this element, which is added to the building skin, as a prosthetic device was already criticized in Brazil in the early 50s by the Swiss architect and educator Max Bill, whose critique implied that the sun shading's the additive application exposed the impracticality of the modernist glass curtain wall. To avoid the sun shading screen's additive and therefore excessive effect, Fry and Drew incorporated them into the building's mass, resulting in a continuously recessed interior space with movable, what they called, partitions of air. Following their observation that in vernacular architecture in British colonial bungalows, all activity was displaced to the semi-outdoors of the veranda, the roofed open portico, Fry and Drew's solution was to incorporate the veranda into the building's mass. Put in other words, they brought the outside in while creating a system of protecting screens that gnawed off the space of the building's interior. So in effect, what happened was that um, Fry and Drew 
created those uh, liminal spaces that were unusable uh, as filtering devices that just took off the spatial um, uh, fluidity of the space of the building's mass. For Sharon, the opening of the fully extended balcony at Ife, uh, here at the northern facade, continued his and others' experiments in Israel. So Sharon created this kind of evolution of uh, the facade in Tel Aviv architecture. Interestingly, from the eclectic Orientalism that refers to the Arab vernacular, uh, through um, uh, the modernist experiments, uh, the introduction of the Israeli version of the Brissolet, the Trisol, and coming back to this thickening of the skin of the building that refers b back with this tower to uh, the vernacular Orientalist uh, version. So in Nigeria, he provided a more elegant or in his words, organic solution, as the balcony of the reverse pyramid is neither an applied sun shading device nor a structural secondary outer space. Interpreted in his narrative as a metaphorical thickening of the wall, it was as if the shaded volumetric openings were carved out of the staggered cantilevered stories. To enhance the volumetric presence of the building, the walls and the cantilevers were distinguished by a dramatic play of color. The walls and columns were painted dark gray, and the cantilevers that are exposed to the sun were painted white. So it's kind of taking a very modernist uh, trick uh, and applies it in a very different context. This chiaroscuro dematerializes the darkened areas and creates the illusion that the cantilevers float one on top of the other. Yet this illusion is interfered by the bulky stairs, cylinders that cut through the cantilevers' horizontal lines. Painted too in dark gray, the towers stress that the darkened areas are in fact the mass that constitutes the very flesh of the building, even if the elongated facades are faced with wide spans of glass louvers. When shaded, the transparent glass becomes part of the dark mass in continuity with the body of the towers. The reverse pyramid, therefore, contrasted with Ibadan Campus design logic of the recess Gnodov cubic volume. As Fryan Drew's drawings show, interior partitions were difficult to incorporate without blocking ventilation. In order to maximize airflow, Sharon's inverted pyramid does away with most of the partitions to maximize the correspondence between the building's used interior space and its volume. The cantilevered balconies function not only as access galleries to the classrooms, but also as shaded spaces to extend classroom activities outdoors. So these are very generous spaces. The recommendation of the Wisconsin team to site the buildings on a, ride, on, a ride, on a rise, raise them above the ground, and using a double roof, further shaped the evolution of the campus core's inverted pyramid typology. So here we have uh, the Faculty of uh, Education, and we can see in this drawing how the humanities logic is now uh, raised from the ground and doubled here with this double roof. So uh, we have the same logic just um, um, extended and sophisticated. The design for the Faculty of Education extended the inverted pyramid structure with two significant revisions. First, by adding a raised roof, it allowed for vertical evaporation of warm air. And second, by elevating the building from the ground by massive concrete trusses, it allowed for a breeze to sweep the open ground floor acting as an extension of outdoor space and serving as a cool shading area, shaded area. In addition, planters and resting areas continue this outdoor atmosphere even on the second floors. The Wisconsin report emphasized the roof as the single most important component of a building for thermal insulation in the tropical climate and recommended a double roof for ventilation and a wide overhang for rain protection and reduction of glare. The faculties of administration, law, and social sciences, designed as one ensemble, follow, these suggestions with, solo, follow those suggestions with raised umbrella roofs whose perimeters far exceeded those of the buildings, acting as overhang that provided shade to the north and south facades and allowed warm air to evaporate. 
With trusses extending diagonally from the roofs to the ground, the building silhouette created the illusion of inverted pyramids, which connected them visually with the humanities and education buildings. And here we see better the connection to the education building. Expanding on the vocabulary of the latter, the buildings were raised above the ground, creating a shaded courtyard with planters and seating areas at ground level, as well as a raised internal mall designed as a hanging garden. Following the Wisconsin team's report, but completely re-envisioning the type of climate responsive building most suited to the tropics, this building's design took the veranda inside outside ambiguity and transformed it into a courtyard logic of hanging gardens and cool shaded resting area. With the shaded ground level and the hanging gardens of the upper floors, the raised courtyard created dynamic inside-outside relations whose effects far exceeded strictly climatic functions. These relationships were further reinforced by the bridges that cut through the administration law and social sciences buildings or the ramp leading to the central li library, as in my opening image. While Fry and Drew's tropical architecture treated students as passive containers of energy that needed to be conserved, the University of Ife's dynamic design increased not only ventilation and evaporation, but also the vitality and freedom of movement of students who inhibit, inhabited the space. To the Wisconsin team's conception of the human as an active agent, simultaneously affecting and affected by tropical environment, Sharon's team added the Zionist ideology of national revival based on biological regeneration. I would like to conclude this talk by turning back to the question of the ornament and the thickening of the building surface as a site where locality can be inscribed. For Sharon, the challenge was how to imbue the campus building with buildings with, loca with local identity without resorting to applied ornamentation or a fake synthesis of the arts, which usually means modern buildings and technology with ornament, with art as applied ornament in terms of sculptures or murals. In other words, instead of dressing the modernist buildings up in your Yoruba garb, at stake was to render the modernist building skin itself Yoruba. In Ododua Hall, specifically designed to facilitate Yoruba theater production, the cutouts, groove texturing of the walls, and the amorphic murals that have nothing to do with murals in the area create a plastic festive space, a sort of Louis Kahn's modern monumentality rendered free form. Rather than exhibit its structural lightness, as one historian suggested, the cut, in my opinion, the cutouts are self referential a reminder of the materiality and plasticity of the wall, which was further accentuated by the groovings. So it's really hard to see, but here are some groovings on this wall. And Sharon juxtaposed these groovings to this uh, figurine, this Yoruba figurine dating from the 14th century in his Kibbutz and Baos book. So at first I was very suspicious of this uh, juxtaposition. I thought it was just, you know, it became fashionable in the 70s to refer to local um, art as inspiration. So I thought it was after the fact. But in, in the archives, uh, I found out that Sharon referred to this as, a, as an architectural inspiration already in 1960 when he visited uh, the Museum of uh, Ife that was established by uh, Cornelius Forbinius. <laughs> Cornelius Forbinius, is that how? Well, a German uh, ethnologist and anthropologist who kind of discovered Yoruba art. By the 60s, textured grooving became prevalent among architects as a form of repressed ornament, literally pressed onto the building surface. While Sharon drew from contemporary practices in Europe and the US, such as the UNESCO building that I mentioned earlier, he juxtaposed the textured surface of the Ododua Hall with an image of a Yoruba famed bronze sculpture uh, dating back to the 14th century, suggesting this was the specific reference for the building's corrugated grooving. In one of his early reports, Sharon had noted these sculptures were of special architectural interest alongside the Yoruba King's Palace. Significantly, Sharon singled out this sculptural tradition and specifically referred to its architectural rather than artistic value. What architectural lessons could the Yoruba groove sculpture offer to the modernist Sharon? Mm -hmm. 
Compared with the abstracted African sculptures and masks known in the West through their modernist appropriation, these Yoruba sculptures were distinctly naturalistic. Unlike Picasso's rendering of African masks and tattoos as markers and vehicles of abstraction, this sculpture's grooving accentuated their three-dimensional naturalism. So here we have a practice of Loss's uh, antagonist, uh, Van de Velle, uh, and uh, his use of, uh, sculpt of, of grooving uh, as, a, as a low relief as well, uh, as a structural ornament. Similar to, moral, to mural inscriptions in Yoruba shrine architecture, the grooving is reserved for the face or torso of Yoruba royalty and signifies their spiritual attributes. And here, in a fascinating photo that I have no idea who took and what was the context, um, we have the Yoruba king um, situating himself among those uh, figurines, uh, and there's, as as a lineage with no chronology. So they all kind of coexist at the same temporal dimension. Reminiscent of the practice of sacrification and tattoo, these bodily inscriptions thicken the skin in low relief and direct attention to its double function as a boundary and expression, what literary theorist An Cheng identifies as skin's complicated relation to essence versus surface. As a vibrant and sensorial interface, the skin is the site where the spiritual is localized, pinned down to the individual and in place by the performance of inscription and the traces it leaves. In this African-Israeli encounter, the skin is neither entirely bare nor a form of inauthentic dressing, but instead where the biological and the cultural intertwine and reach their highest synthesis. Using this Yoruba tradition to complicate Western metaphysics privileging of death over surface or the hidden over the visible, which is also the logic of degeneration, right? It's the moral, um, uh, it's, it's the moral degeneration that is expressed as symptoms uh, on the body surface. Sharon liberates cultural and environmental inscriptions from their modernist taboo, perceiving them following his Zionist thinking as mutually constitutive and as the only condition contrary to Loss's thinking, for a productive society. There are a few lessons to be learned from this rather convoluted story that took us from Ife in Nigeria to Israel through Dessau and Vienna with a detour to Madison, Wisconsin and Sao Paulo. First, that the history of modern architecture, if it wishes to be truly global, can no longer afford to overlook the complex itineraries, multiple actors, and unexpected encounters that have thoroughly shaped architectural production in the last century. Second, that in order for us to recognize these various novel sites of architectural production, we need to move beyond the conventional archives and architectural publications, and complement them, even if this means by confrontation, with competing epistemologies, such as the sc scarring practice, or contested derivatives, such as the Zionist men-environment relations. Only through such reading, readings are analysis of architecture critic can critically engage with and shed important light on economic or technical scientific discourses, such as development or the environment. Thank you. So the two seats here, so I imagine I'm supposed to take the other one, but um, uh, not in the interest of actually offering a, a formal response, but I am going to um, uh, sit here and, and help um, uh, shepherd questions. But I just wanted to begin by thanking you for um, what to my mind was less a um, convoluted story uh, than an incredibly sort of uh, precise and, and certainly complicated topography of these these different agents, these different discourses, and these different uh, ways in which bodies and climates and uh, an ornament or cultural trappings, you know, begin to come together and um, uh, in um, sort of initially illegible ways. So I mean, I think this is a, you know, a quite remarkable piece of work. And I wanted to, I will ask the first question, but that's probably all. Um, uh, I was very struck when you opened um, with a sort of a side to um, 
the archival difficulty, yeah? the, the difficulty in accessing archives, and and you know, somewhat reductively, my first thought was that that was a reference to the difficulty of um, obtaining documents in the Nigerian context. And as you talk unfolded into all these different contexts, um, it struck me that that was not necessarily what you're referring to, and certainly the the um, careful navigation of Sharon and the context of labor Zionism and that sort of early period um, also comes with its own archival complexities and, and troubles. And so I was just, um, I guess, wanting to, um, to see if I can get you to just unpack a little bit what the, like, what the uh, archival difficulties are. I mean, I understand they're difficult. Uh, the documents are missing, mm -hmm. uh, that the whole history of, um, uh, of um, Nigerian archives is, is a complicated one, but, but am I right that it's, the, the, the remark was actually pointing to, to something yeah, more, di more diffuse than that? Uh, um, yeah, in a sense, it's a, it's an architectural archive outside of the archi of, outside mm -hmm. of architecture. Mm -hmm. That's that's a question where to locate uh, uh, those clues mm -hmm. uh, um, in regards, for example, the reimagining of the countryside. It is not something that any of the architects uh, um, uh, ever stated, mm -hmm. or uh, Sharon's relationship to the climate. It was something that I had to dig out from his own recollections of his kibbutz life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he mentioned how they were singing and dancing to, uh, um, to fight malaria. Um, or um, there is a quote where he talks about um, butterflies uh, and birds as, um, as uh, something that uh, could intrude into the building. There's no problem with that because it, it was a displacement uh, uh, of the mosquito uh, uh, who, uh, whose bites can uh, be uh, dangerous for, because of malaria. So the displacement of the mosquito into uh, um, cheerful butters, butterflies and birds. So it, it is really reading between the lines, reading the architect, how he operated, how... Um, uh, his uh, embodied experience uh, as pioneer came to bear on his reading of architecture. So for me, uh, this is a side note, um, the fact that he first established a kibbutz and worked as a beehive person there and a builder, um, and then went to the Bauhaus, mm -hmm. completely reshapes the thinking of what he studied at the Bauhaus um, and how he related to, Ma to Hannes Meyer. Um, and this part of the story is always neglected. It's always the European educated uh, architect uh, arrives to Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Nigerian archive is even more uh, difficult to uh, unpack. Um, besides the lack of documents, uh, it demanded a lot of um, scrutiny via newspapers, uh, for example, what Nigerian uh, agricultural faculty explained as a, as a contemporary problem. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to the reimagining of the countryside. Uh, and uh, and reading through uh, uh, the text that the university uh, educators, uh, uh, the various vi vice chancellors wrote, as part of their academic work. Many of them were agricultural experts. And uh, in inauguration uh, uh, days for the university, for some buildings. So there is, a, there is a lot of reading and digging and sifting through a material that just usually does not, um, uh, is not contained within the architectural history perspective. I think one of the most uh, remarkable things about um, uh, about that type of expansion is the the way in which you um, brought those lessons back with incredibly um, precise ways to um, the you know the technologies of the of the balcony of the details of the section and I think this is um, um, uh, a, a, a type of register that's you know often lost in expanded histories and so the way that that we returned yeah with sort of incredible um, 
uh, precision to to the comparison of Ibadan and Ife um, balconies, I think, was a really important gesture in that regard. But other questions? Uh, this one up here. Oh, thanks for a, a lovely presentation. Um, one of the major figures behind the discussion about existence minimum in Germany was Alexander Klein. And as you know, Alexander Klein left, uh, fled Germany for Palestine in 1934. Did uh, Sharon have any contact with Klein? And uh, could you maybe, did he ever have a, take a position on the existence minimum question? Um. I'm not sure, I'm not a, uh, I don't consider myself a Sharon expert per se, uh, so I wouldn't know about that specifically, but Alexander Klein is an interesting figure because he was interested in climate and also participated in a, one of those uh, tropical architecture Im imperial uh, conferences. Uh, uh, the one that was uh, in um, Mexico City in 1937, I think. Uh, but having read through his text, it didn't pertain to climate at all, so I didn't um, include it in my, in my research. So he's one of those neglected and interesting figures in uh, architectural history, uh, Israeli architectural history, uh, that, that were involved in, in this imperial international discourse. Um, and existence minimum is very interesting in relation to housing, also in the post-colonial period, the question of basic needs, basic human needs, uh, and, um, and the rights of housing. Uh, but uh, this is not something that I worked on. Thank you for, for the talk. My question relates a little bit to um, Felicity's last comment as you sort of complicate the archive and then come back to the sections and to the formal analysis, which I agree, it's fascinating. But the problem I was having looking at it as after you've gone through this very evocative argument of climate as a construct, not a problem that needs to be constructed in order to um, you know, retrofit it in a way. I found myself not really believing any of those uh, sketches. Like, so I'd like you to, to tell us a little bit about why should we believe those sketches if you do? When and why were they produced? Does the air really work that way through the building or are they just looking to, you know, they just want to build an inverted pyramid because it looks really very modernist? Well, the question, does it really work? <laughs> uh, probably depends on the season that you uh, come there. When I was there, it worked, but uh, I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm better in the hot climates. I, I wouldn't know. There is a guy in Israel who's who, climate. That's really his research, only his research, and he invented a, a kind of a machine that can uh, um, check uh, uh, climate control devices in a building whether they work or not. Uh, and I urged him to go to Nigeria and test it there, but that's not the approach that I will. That's that's simply not what I do. Yes. There are air conditions, air conditioners in, the, in those buildings. Um, uh, but I, uh, specifically for the closed offices, but the classrooms are pretty well ventilated. Uh, some glass louvers were painted black uh, in order to be able, I think, to project slides. That's a problem that uh, you have also uh, at universities in India. So it is also about the technology of the auditoria or the classroom that uh, demands a different, um, uh, it's, it's like it's one, it's, it's either you have a, a breeze or you have the good conditions for, the, for projection. It's like either or. So the question of does it work is less a concern for me. I don't think that uh, University College Baden uh, works better. Mary and then Chris, yeah? So. Okay. I, first, thank you so much, Ayala. And it is wonderful to see the, the formal analysis and, and how that's evolved. Um, I had a, a variation on Maria's question, but I have two questions actually. The first easy one maybe is, I'm a little nervous about sort of 
Brie Soleil is colonial, and uh, this form is post-colonial. Uh, how do you explain Brazil? I also think in general there's a lot more continuity between colonial and post-colonial architecture, although this project may defy that continuity. The second question really is why, how, how do we know it's not just brutalist, fashionable cantilever, it's, this is basically a variation on Maria's, as opposed to determined per se or primarily even by climate. There's so many cantilevers in this period, um, inverted sections. Um, and how do you relate it to like that word brutalism that floats all over the, the globe about this time? Well, um, I'll start with the second question, okay. I guess. Climate was a problem that needed to be addressed. Sure. And the inverted pyramid in this tiny little sketch that I found contains within it the entire story. Um, this, is, this goes back to the question of the archive. Sharon didn't theorize this, and he definitely didn't theorize this as a post-colonial reaction. Uh, it was something that I kind of extracted out of that tiny little uh, drawing, which is really a critique of tropical architecture as not modernist enough. That's his critique. Um, in relation to brutalism, yes, of course, those uh, forms are fashionable. It's fun to produce this kind of sculptural, monumental works that they didn't build at the time in Israel. Um, one of the architects involved, Harold Rubin, came from South Africa, where they also produced uh, camp uh, brutalist campuses and very much influenced by uh, Latin American architecture, Brazilian architecture. Uh, the reference now to your first question, I do not present the Bristol as colonial, you know, uh, Le Corbusier first, uh, um, tweaked this idea for, uh, for uh, Paris and Barcelona, and so it was not necessarily a post-colonial project. And um, it is just a conception of the tropics specifically for the British, as I said at the beginning of the talk, not the Brazilian architects. The conception of the tropics as um, a specific environmental sociological condition that doesn't allow uh, uh, productiveness that inhibits the tropical people from, um, from developing or entering into world history as, a, as new subjects, that was what, what, uh, what was at the heart of their discourse. And their brisoles and their sun shading devices are not the same as the one practiced in Brazil at the time. As, a, as an affirmation and celebration of sculptural form. So there, theirs are much more re restrained um, sun shading devices. Now, what I like about the Max Bill um, critique is that it's usually uh, uh, being, it's usually as regarded as a, as a almost racist critique of, uh, of Latin American architecture. They are not modern enough. They are, um, um, they are abusing modernist principles uh, and uh, they are incapable of uh, using modernist principles uh, calculably, uh, in a calculated sense, rationally. But when he refers to the Soleil, this is not a modernist device that they miss calculate or misrepresent, when he refers to the Brissolet, he's really criticizing the curtain wall. So it's a critique of the North rather than a critique of the South. Said, is it also not the case that, um, I mean, your point was not that um, Sharon's balconies were post-colonial, but that the way in which they marked their difference from the um, Fry and Drew's um, was the distinction that, that was being made. So it's not that 
either, you know, in some sort of essential form, the first was colonial, the second was mm -hmm. post-colonial, but under the, the mandate of taking the environment into account that this was his formal rhetorical trope to mark that shift. And so I don't think she was saying this is post-colonial. She was saying this is a claim to the post-colonial articulated yeah, through yeah. the distinction of the balcony. And so in a sense, yeah. uh -huh. sorry, in the, in the sense, the balcony is the Israeli colonial project, which I skipped here. Uh, this is where the horizontal, uh, the, the bend window, the ribbon window, uh, is acclimatized into the Israeli, uh, into, the, into Palestine, and is, uh, becomes a kind of a, um, uh, secondary out of spa outer space instead of the ribbon window that doesn't work in that climate. So it's a colonial Jewish project. So th there's nothing easy about those distinctions, but I'm interested in how Sharon reacts to, to the British um, legacy there, uh, a very vibrant living legacy because British architects continue to work and Fran Drew also built on this campus as well as James Cabot. Um, uh, I had something else to say. But Does he ever refer? I, I, you're very convincing that he's trying to do something different, Ayala. I'm just curious, and it doesn't ch challenge your argument at all. Does he ever refer to this as a post-colonial identity? No, not at all. And he, um, he hardly ever uses the, he doesn't use the term, those terms at all, not colonial, that not post-colonial. That would surprise me if he did. Yeah. Chris. Um, <coughs> hi, Ayala. Um, such a wonderful talk and so rich. And uh, I wrote a lot of stuff down and I have to keep taking my glasses off to read them. But I, I, um, the, thing I, the thing I wanted to try to tease out, because there's, there's so many moving parts to the story, it's, and, and you have to pin things down to work out the relationships historically, temporally, spatially. One of the things that obviously you're very aware of is the continuity of the concept of tropicalism way back into the 18th, 19th century, going into colonialism through the bungalow and through these other tempered structures, in which they developed an idea called medical topography, in which what you've identified I, what you've isolated as components to this moving machine are things such as the body and the individual, the tempered envelope and structure of a building, but there's a third category that seems to fall off when medical science starts to become more linked to bacteriology instead of miasma theory, which is the landscape, the immediate surroundings, the immediate topography of land. Mm -hmm. So that what happens is that climate starts to become this essentialist, nebulous term that isn't quite fixed, has, doesn't have a specific fixity to an immediate surroundings. It's sort of like, it, it's, it's more pliable to questions of n nation because it can be more of a general question instead of a, a topographic specific question. And so what, what I'm wondering is what was the, what were the triggers and questions of immediate landscape to this wider new narrative of the nation that, that when we talk about colonialism in the 19th century, immediate surroundings, immediate regions have regional climates, have specific topographic climates, which allow you to start to talk of representation in an architecture by reaction to an immediate surrounding. Now the question is openable because the immediate surrounding is, has dissolved, has dissolved, has, has somehow been solved through modern medicine, which I think is a false um, um, expansion. I think there is still questions of the immediate surrounding going on. So I'm wondering what were in your archive findings those questions and the, um, the other thing that intrigued me was the role of, of, of you, you introduce the role of the Israeli Jew into this subject, which suddenly opens up a sort of dialectical question of the stand of Fry and Drew, which is a, new, is, is a very innovative thing. So, but I'm still not clear how you've created this figure, which you said displaces another. In, in Palestine, this this figure of the the new you, to quote you the new Jew 
in, uh, um, I guess, the old, old Palestine. How is that figure set up when they have to have interlocutor relationships to African universities and African professors? What are they posi positioning themselves as, as a, as a modern figure? It, it wasn't still not clear to me how they distinguish themselves nationally, politically, um, and modern um, as a trope in, in regard to outreach. Mm -hmm. So those are the two questions mm -hmm. I'm asking. Thank you. Well, the first one is very easy to answer for me from my perspective. Uh, actually, the climate reemerges uh, in the American discourse or the post-war discourse, the one that replaces the colonial one, uh, reemerges as a microclimate. So in order to become scientifically workable and manageable, Fry and Drew's uh, uh, big band of tropical architecture, trop of the tropics, uh, becomes, a, becomes really outdated, a fiction that is not usable for anything. And even for Fry and Drew, um, the 1956 book, book is architecture in the humid uh, zone, and then in 1964 it becomes, it's expanded to uh, uh, architecture in the humid and dry zones. So uh, the dry zone become part of the tropical. Um, so the, the, the tropical architecture under the British discourse by the 50s, in a, di in a dialectic that is, uh, that is very uh, char characteristic of, um, of knowledge production, becomes institutionalized exactly when it no longer bears, holds no water. So th this is the critical moment where where it, really the tropics mean nothing at all compared to other studies. Um, now, the second question relates to you know, the, entire, the entire dissertation, the entire book project, which is uh, the very complex negotiation of Israelis and how they position, position themselves in Africa. And uh, through such stories, I want to show how the Israelis try to blacken themselves rather than whiten themselves. Uh, in this story, you have a sensibility that uh, belongs to uh, the Jews' anxieties of the generation in Europe, rather than uh, the, the, the body that is reinvented in Palestine. Via this encounter with a post-colonial subject in Nigeria, those anxieties, those um, um, uh, they, they are mirrored through the post-colonial subject to and reflect back, refract back to the uh, to the Jew. Um, I could go on and on about this, but my main point was that the Israelis try to position themselves as. Um, you, you could say better whites, or non-imposing whites, or uh, mediating figures, people who have already translated once European architecture into uh, de a developing country, and now are able to translate it once more. They are proficient in uh, translating architecture, not only to climate, but also to um, uh, state conditions that are very uh, precarious. To work, so working in emergency conditions, um, um, working on the ground with the people, promoting egalitarian uh, labor, and also um, 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 applying architecture in non and, and also other fields of development in non-conventional, non-text textbooks ways to uh, uh, to the context that they encounter. Um, so yeah, th these are many moving components to, the, to this story, but that's basically the essence of what I, I'm I think saying. just to end that, behind that was my one question, because I don't know enough about this, that I think you're describing the Ashkenazi Jew, the narrative of, of the Ashkenazi, and so the Mizrahi or Sephardi were not part of that Essential. Actually, in the French colonies, they had a big role to play because they spoke right, French. Right. Um, so um, 
but uh, I, I didn't work on the French colonies, mm -hmm. and um, all of the architects that I looked at, they were uh, Ashkenazi Jews, so you're certainly right, correct? Right. Hi, hi, that was a fantastic talk, Kyle. It's really a pleasure to learn, continue to learn from you. And so I just, this is a question quite different uh, from some of these, I guess, back to the archive in a sense. Um, and to the very, very end of your talk where you put development and environment together. Uh, do you, from you know, reading the newspapers and the things that, that you were doing, is there a way, and I also realize this is outside the scope uh, formally of what you've been working on, what can you say, if anything, about the role of the oil companies in Nigeria, either you know, the American Shell or BP, uh, in this you know, anything but post-colonial moment, in which really what we're talking about is transition into, as you said, development. Uh, and I'm asking that because I'm just, I'm honestly just, I'm just curious about the program of the university, which is very striking. It, you know, it does um, follow b broadly the land grant model where you have professional schools of very particular types, the agricultural school that you described and the education, the school of education. And, the, you know, I would read those as belonging to the biopolitical project of producing subjects mm -hmm. for a nation, yes, but also for an economic and social transformation. Um, and so those young uh, kids there in, in the image behind you are, in a sense, those figures. Uh, and um, and so, so they're, they're, they're anything but archetypal, stereotypical, et cetera, in this sense. They're very, very specific. So it's the specificity, that's what I'm asking. So on the one hand, it's fascinating, you know, the problems of, you know, building a university in the kind of rural area in, the in, 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 in inland, uh, away from the cities, uh, attracting elite academics out there, and so on, seems to be mirrored in some of the, the, the demands that the oil companies were being made of the now self-educating population uh, in African countries at this time, particularly in the, in the West, where there was a lot of uh, oil. So I'm wondering if you see if these forces ever meet. I, I guess there's not the kind of technical education here that might support at some entry level, you know, engineers and so on into that industry? Are there, is there something like that in other universities in this building program? And if so, does that, you know, somehow articulate with this particular form of quote unquote development? Well, I have a, an easy way to get around this question, um, which is a, which of course complicates the story very much so because Oil replaces agriculture, and oil replaces development, you can say, in Nigeria. Um, so these years are the years that you still don't have the oil boom. Uh, so, and the oil is in the eastern part of the country, not the western side, but the western side is the dominant one uh, with the federal government situated in it. Um, so, I haven't seen in my records any reference to oil uh, um, in the education reforms here. And in my story, oil is, the, oil is what kills um, the story that I want to tell here, the story of development as it was imagined. Um, but I, I know Daniel Barber is uh, going to include the BP headquarters um, in, uh, in his book, but Barber um, um, talks about those buildings in, in the traditional sense of, okay, you have European administrators working in this environment and therefore they need to, to have a, um, a climate that allows them to work, basically, to be the corporate universal men of the all gays rather than the Nigerian subjects. Um, I cannot answer this, but uh, maybe I will be able to answer it in my next project when I will work on uh, Abuja, Abuja's planning, which um, as m many of you may know, uh, was uh, many architects were involved, but uh, McHarg, the ecologist, was um, uh, central to it. Um, so how oil and ecology uh, intersect, um, I wouldn't know, it's mainly oil money 
rather than oil as a resource. Yeah. You know, one thought, I don't know if this is useful, but you know, there's this thesis which actually comes out of lit a scholarship on Nigeria, Michael Watts, for example, of the oil curse. Oil, as mm -hmm. you said, the boom, you know, it, it, corruption, whatever you get, and, and this, all this goes down the drain. It seems to me your project could, in principle, complicate that project. Like, if you tell that story, not from the coast, but from, that's what, with, I meant the mm -hmm. refineries and so on, mm -hmm. you know, and all the money, therefore, concentrated. Mm -hmm. But, but if you tell that story from, from another geography and from, from within, you know, this, this other, this rather more, in, in a sense, utopian on the one hand and obviously neo-colonial on another uh, project of, of Bildung, basically, of mm -hmm. nation building, but through the production of certain kinds of, a, a kind of citizenry through education. I wonder if it, if it complicates the oil curse narrative a little bit. That, that's why I was asking. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a great point. And, uh, it's like oil in the countryside, also how oil reshaped the country in a productive rather than a substituting mode. That could be another angle. I got past the mic. Thank you, Ayala. That was, that was so beautiful. And I was actually thinking of how useful this story is against the ones that we're more familiar with, with, with a Dodoma and Abuja and the planning of those capitals as being um, symbolic in terms of their inscription on the landscape. And here we're releasing that on the, you know, on the level of the building and not as projecting a sort of outwardly legible semiotics, but in terms of organizing a whole series of techno-scientific um, discourses, as well as discourses on resources. And one of the things that I, I thought was most beautiful about this reading was this um, dialectic that you set up between degeneracy and rejuvenation in a way that, that it was, it, it, it seemed like it was, if I'm understanding correctly, that it was the sort of architect's frame of having to oscillate between those two things that then intersperse the resource as something which would get you out of that bind in a way. And so maybe just to connect back to your question, Reinhold, the, um, the way in which you've read the resources figured through this campus, both as you know, climate, which isn't actually challenging if you have the right tools to resolve it, but also the, the human capital that you mentioned as a kind of hedge against the vagaries of agriculture and maybe even eventually oil, which is, you know, controlled by these big multinational BPs and mm -hmm. BP headquarters designed by Fry and Drew. So uh, th there might be a way that the, the theorization of the resource, which I know you've already done, <laughs> um, helps to open, open up those ways in which these different um, transnational rhetorics get Intersposed in different spaces, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the way I think of it is if the human is also a resource, then there is a dialectic between different actors, different resources. So you have the human, you have land or climate, and you have oil. So this can really triangulate very nicely. Um, I will have to, I will, I will definitely think about it later on. Also, oil is an important component in the story because many of the American companies that worked in Africa, they actually had much more, much more projects in the Middle East at the time because of oil. So um, in a sense, um, somebody first needs to write about their work in the Middle East for me to be able to write about their work in, in Africa, but I have a tendency to bypass this kind of problems. Um, so, um, so I will definitely, this is definitely a component that needs to, to play in, yeah. Just, uh, uh, I was afraid, um, just link, it's not a question actually, but um, I suppose Polynesia is there also, I suppose. Sorry, is the, who? Polynesia is there as well in your story via Laos mm -hmm. and the tattoo mm -hmm. and I, uh, um, the, the way the grooved statue arrives, uh, it, it seems to me it re almost it requires you to, not just the Van der Velder and so on, but to work through that whole mm -hmm. um, narrative. Because I think, I think that what's, what's permanently rich in, in your argument is that you, you swim upstream always. You're almost in every gesture going the opposite direction than the, than the, mm -hmm. than the conventional discourse. And, and I think the biggest upstream move is, is and, and the most directly anti-colonial move, because I, I, I just don't think the narrative is in the colonial, post-colonial register at all, but in the kind of psychosexual mm 
fantasies which are with Loos, uh, where where the figure of the other, uh, the tattooed face of the Polynesian head, is n neither behind nor in front. Like it's not the past and it's not the future, and it's it's somehow much more gripping. And in Loos's argument, as you know, it's labour. He argue he he's basically argues it through from labour. So I, it seems to me you could successfully uh, deepen a little bit that, that dimension of your argument, which I found was so, which so compelling, so that we could finally then read these white bands for what they are, as you yourself pointed out, within, within a more or less generic um, modern discourse. In other words, what is it that distinguishes those white bands from the criminality of the dark bands in the face of the dark flesh, so a kind of black on black scarring or inking versus the white on white floating beyond the black. And I thought in, in the analysis of the balconies that, that I, I th it was f so precise what you were saying about how the blackness between the white bands nevertheless, including the glass, reads as mass. Um, and therefore you then said something like, so therefore they're kind of carved in. Mm -hmm. So then we are carving like the groove and inking in black. So I, I, think, I think there's a really um, strong uh, argument that you're making about black uh, in that sense. So when you say um, the blackening of the Israeli kind of consultant, it seems to me that all of, all of these things could, could, could be stitched up slightly more. I'm asking for more vulgarity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 by the way, love the lack of vulgarity in all of the answers to the questions. You, you were, the min most minimal answer you can give is about four or five twists backwards or forwards. I'm just inviting one more loop back and maybe pick up uh, lows along the way. And, and then a completely irrelevant thing. Uh, Hannes Meyer, for whatever reason, was quite obsessed with insects. Mm -hmm. So I just kept thinking about the malaria mm -hmm. and the insects and this beautiful thing you said about the butterflies and the bees mm -hmm. and so on. And, and there's, there is some, some sense in which insect life um, is a protagonist. I, I, I don't know, I just get that feeling. One seems so light and irrelevant, but I, but I think the blackness is the more serious mm -hmm. uh, point. But you know, you know that uh, you know when my has my lists is like ten things that one needs to pay attention to. I think sex is number one, which makes sense. But insects are number three. Um, uh, housing, shelter, uh, shelter comes like number seven or eight. You know, I I, I have a I have a feeling like the a genuinely post-colonial discourse might be an intensely insect-focused discourse. <laughs> Thank you. Just Thank you a, so much for the talk. Just a small remark that um, when I looked at Yoruba shrine architecture or practices, then I found it fascinating that they paint them first white as a substrate for uh, inscription. So I, I wanted blackness to be uh, an important part of, of architecture identity and so on, but it was the white as dressing to become the basis for a second inscription that uh, complicates the entire uh, story. So th the, bad, the black body as reference is not a reference at all, in a sense. Um, and I, I need to read more on African uh, epistemology in order to understand that better. I haven't found the right resources. Yeah, just so the, would, it would be the black body, the black body as constructed. Mm -hmm. In other words, instead of the, the black body is in the past and in the other, and is what what is has been transcended. The construction, the daily construction of blackness as the. Uh, this is what I found mm -hmm. so direct in your analysis of the balconies. Yeah, and the Israelis it's, admire blackness because it is a marker of the natural relationship, organic relationship right. to the environment. And I cite uh, 
like there is a poem about uh, that I cite in my work that which describes the African uh, doll or the African body of the woman who works in the field as one that shines shines uh, in the in under the sun that never gets old uh, so there is a, an Israeli projection of desires of acclimatization that lock the Africans in their blackness fetishize the blackness yeah so you just can't resist right because so then the use of the white as a substrate is is too good, too, uh, and you have to because the black is constructed as such. The equivalence of the black lines to the white, Josephine Baker, et cetera, this in the low sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think it's very, it's, it's, um, it lurks so strong in your argument that I kind of feel like a mm -hmm. little bit of st steroids in Thank that you. part of it. Mm -hmm. The next mark along. Um, I actually want to get to, uh, I don't know if you know this um, essay that uh, relates to the question of African epistemology, which is Robert Thompson wrote an essay called uh, You Orba Art Criticism that refers specifically to the scarification. Mm -hmm. And it relates totally to the um, projection that you just talked to, the Israeli projection about that. Because what he says is that the scarification uh, on the sculpture is like the scarification of uh, uh, running a line in the earth and running a line on the body, which brings forth mm -hmm. uh, the aesthetic quality. In other words, cultivation is not an anti-natural. It is the way to bring nature out, mm -hmm. to bring the, the nature out in the sculpture, in the, in the human body, uh, in the cultivation. And so the way that would play in uh, the Israeli epistemology of cultivating the land uh, and that form of organization and the way that would then happen in this kind of development and the way, uh, to go back, to, this sort of relates Mark's uh, questions uh, but also brings back Mary's question about brutalism, like how do you now get from the scarification of the concrete that was happening at that time into a whole nother uh, kind of deep, uh, is it a deep organicism or is it a deep cultivation of raw material, like what's at stake in that brutalness? Um, and that might get to, um, well, Mark, what was your term? Uh, uh, not brutal, but uh, uh, vulgar. You know, it might get somewhere between the brutal and the vulgar uh, and the bodily, for sure, and the state of the body in someone like Lowe's. And well, for me, for me the, interesting, the, the, the interesting challenge that uh, I am still not willing to take uh, is um, to reflect via the, the story on brutalism in the North, brutalism elsewhere, and ask the same questions. Uh, it's not like there is a proper brutalism, and here is what, uh, what those crazy Israelis are doing in Africa, or uh, derivative Israelis doing in Africa, but it is, it is asking you questions about brutalism in the North. But uh, thank you about the, I will, I will ask you for the reference. <laughs> Any last questions? No? Well, let's thank Ayala again uh, for her talk. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.